Tonight on CTV News, the council's long-term plan hearings get underway. Prince Harry touches down tomorrow. Where can you see him? Around town. And what next for the mainland tactics? Broadcasting across Canterbury. From the CTV studio, this is First at Five. Kia ora, good evening. Royal Fever is taking over Christchurch. The fifth and, fifth and line to the throne touches down in the city tomorrow and members of the public will get a chance to see him in the flesh as he tours Quank City and the Restart Mall. Here's Marcus Gibbs with a preview of what the Prince will be doing. Get ready to meet the Redhead Prince. Tomorrow Prince Harry will be in this very spot, walking the hollow grounds of Cashel Mall. And already word is spreading about his impending visit. The excitement levels are building. Oh, love the royalty. Following a tram ride from New Regent Street, Prince Harry will first visit Quake City to learn firsthand the impacts of the Canterbury earthquakes, before spending about half an hour mingling with the locals on Cashel Street. It's looking like he'll have quite a few hands to shake, maybe even another cheeky kiss. He's a nice looking guy. Oh, he's such a sweet wee boy, isn't he? <laughs> So I think they'll love to come out and see him. I'm sure there's a few royals still around out there. Yes, I do. I like the royalty. I think it's nice to belong somewhere like that. And I think it's important when they make the effort to come here that we make the effort to say hello. Oh, I think it's fantastic. Any time they come, it's great. And they just spread a lot of joy and really make time for people, which I think is lovely. My husband has to teach at the university, but my son and I, we will be here. Prince Harry isn't the first royal to take a walk past Restart Mall. When his father, Prince Charles, and the Duchess of Cornwall visited in 2012, they too trekked down Cashel Mall, much to the delight of the thousands of Cantabrians who turned out to watch. But will Prince Harry get the same turnout? Well, most of Christchurch will be at work, but being that this visit to Restart Mall will be in the middle of lunch, the crowd could easily swell to the thousands. Madeline Thomas migrated to New Zealand from England a year and a half ago, and now, ironically, she might meet the Prince for the first time in her life. Closer to him here than I've ever been back in England, so it's a bit strange to kind of fly all the way over and, yeah. He's Obviously following me around the world is the way I see it. Yeah. She says back home the adoration for our royal guest is just the same. Because it's kind of a, a celebrity kind of status, everyone's kind of quite happy to see him out and about. It's a bit of a bit of an event when they kind of come out in public. The royals are in the spotlight at the moment with the birth of a princess. Prince Harry has been bumped further down the line of succession, but the birth has caused excitement for Cantabrians and tourists who are looking forward to watching the little princess grow up. I live in the United States and we're crazy about it. The new princess? Amazing. This will be the first time Rosalie Cameron's had a chance to meet the royals in person, and she can't wait. She says it's the glamour of their lifestyle that makes it all so exciting. We got up in Canada at four in the morning to see Charles and Diana married, and there's just an incredible love story all around with the royalty. There will also be an extra face in the crowd. CTV's Jared McCulloch is taking a break from news reading, and will spend the morning covering the Prince's travels in Christchurch. He'll be right beside Prince Harry as he ventures into the CBD. This enthusiastic reporter can barely contain his excitement at the best of times. So make sure you say hi to him if you're down there tomorrow. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Oh, well done, Marcus. Thank you. Well, after much secrecy and speculation, a date has been set for the implosion of the former police building in the CBD. Owners Naitahu Property says today the building will be imploded on Saturday, May the 30th. If weather is bad, it will occur the following day. Well, it's thought to be the biggest of its type in the world, and Canterbury children will be getting a special Christmas present this year with the opening of a new multi-million dollar playground in the central city. The Margaret Mayhe family playground is due to open just in time for the Christmas holidays. At two and a half hectares wide, this is likely to be one of the world's largest outdoor play areas and is sure to be a popular hit with the children. Christchurch Central Development Unit Acting Director Baden Newitt says the $20 million playground block will provide an exciting adventure space for the whole family. $3 million will be spent on equipment, such as a 10 metre high climbing tower, double flying fox and a 4 metre wide slide. The playground will stretch across one hectare of a 2.5 hectare block, bound by the Avon River, Manchester, Madras and Armagh streets. The playground will have access to a cafe for the parents, picnic areas and an amenities block. It will be a short walk from the Manchester Street bus superstop and the new bus interchange on Litchfield Street. 
Mr Hewitt says once construction of the adjacent East Frame residential precinct begins, more people are likely to move back into the central city and this playground will be right on their doorstep. A contract for the main works on the playground is expected to be awarded next month. Well, still to come here on CTV News, he's spent the last two weeks in the aftermath of the Nepal earthquake. Jatinder Bhattara joins me after the break. When you need to know what's happening in your region of Canterbury, join me, Chris Lynch, for CTV News First at Five, weeknights from five, right here on your local channel, CTV. Computer not working? Replace or repair? DIY or get a technician? Looking for parts? Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. The devotion, the fearlessness, the intensity. Runway model management. First impressions are everything. Sinclair and the team at Gone Fishing as they bring you great stories, fishing tips and beautiful scenery. Gone Fishing, Friday night at 8.30, right here on CTV. And welcome back to CTV News. He's a seismic engineer and the president of the Nepalese community here in Canterbury. And he's just returned from two weeks in Nepal and says the earthquakes there has some good lessons for us back here in New Zealand and Canterbury as well. Uh, welcome to the show uh, from last time as well. Uh, Thank we were you. talking about how uh, you were heading over. Um, so what, yeah, what do you, what's been happening over there? What have you, what have you got from over there? Uh, I went to Nepal as part of Miyamoto Global disaster relief team and our goal was to provide support on engineering front. So basically we were undertaking uh, building assessments and I delivered trainings to local engineers uh, because I have worked on similar type of work in New Zealand and in Indonesia and other countries before. So to uh, help local volunteering engineers which was mobilized by local uh, engineering uh, organization, the umbrella organization. So 20, they have organized, uh, they have mobilized around 2,500 engineers. So my role was to deliver them trainings, to do building assessments. And then we were advising and meeting a lot of government organizations and international organizations and to support them and to discuss with them to understand where the problems are mm. and how a better reconstruction can be done. Okay. So that was the overall goal. Yes, okay. I just want to talk about too, we've seen like, the footage beamed on TV here, but obviously you really, you could see it firsthand. What did you observe? What were the things you saw? Yes, uh, exactly the, what TV shows is not the exact picture there, of course, because in TV we see mostly destructions, but it is not that bad mm -hmm. if you go to Kashmandu Valley itself. Right. But there are pockets of damage and destructions. Yeah, uh, you'll see that. Of course, so there'll be, so be areas where th there is damage, but others that no. So like but if you once you go east and west of Kashmandu Valley, you see like war zone-like areas. But more important for me. Of course, there are massive destructions in many places, and we lost our heritage. That's our identity. Mm -hmm. But more important than that, the human cost of the disaster, mm -hmm. because we lost more than 8,000 people already. Mm -hmm. And then more than 6,000, 
600,000 buildings have been either dis damaged or destructed. So this is a very big value of human cost and the uh, economic cost. Absolutely. Obviously, now that you've seen the damage, now yeah. what what's I guess the next step? Now what next is next to be done? I guess. I think the only solution is build back better, construct compliant buildings, and of course it requires cultural change. But of course, it is an opportunity to bring something better than what we had in the past. Yeah, you just said then um, build back better, and I just wanted to mention here that um, back in the 90s, were you, help, were you helping with the Nepal building codes yes. back then as well? Yes. Related back to that in the 90s to what we know now, and obviously new knowledge that's come in yes. now, what have you learned now that, that needs to be done, I guess, for the next I guess building code, because obviously it'll need to increase, yes. won't it? Of course, I was part of building code development project in Nepal, which I led by a New Zealander, and I'm privileged to work on that project. And I used to think we have achieved a lot in the last 20 years, but it appears it was not sufficient, so far less than what we should have. And of course, there was policy, environment issues, and financial issues. At the same time, we had issues the materials because we, the, the construction is a part of economy, and then there is a cultural thing. So a lot of things has to be changed. And I'm I'm very um, optimistic that these things will change in the future days to come. People have learned lessons, including me. I have learned lessons. So things will change over the time, and we will have better buildings in future. Cool. At the moment, how are the people, uh, I just want to talk about the people as well, obviously how are they dealing with it over there as well? Because you went over and you saw your family as well, didn't you? Yes, I have my families, but I couldn't visit them uh, because I thought my family has not lost uh, human or financially, their houses are okay or homes are okay. So I thought I should better focus on the disaster area yeah, okay. and rather than my family itself. So they're very lucky with that. They are very lucky. So I was more working on the communities to do something and delivering trainings and working with other professional societies in Nepal to do something uh, more important uh, than visiting family. Of course, visiting family is important, but for this time it was more important to do some professional thing. Cool. I just wanted to just quickly say too, this knowledge you've got from over there, what could, what could we bring back to here? I think bringing back here, more important thing to me is the solidarity shown by the New Zealand government, New Zealand people and government. That's more important for us. Cool. And we are very grateful to my fellow New Zealanders uh, for the solidarity they have shown in time of crisis and time of dire need. Absolutely. And well, now New Zealand okay. Okay. Yeah, Sorry, thank okay. you so much for that. I really do appreciate thank it coming in. I really do appreciate uh, it. Thank you very much. All righty, a new, new Brighton businessman has once again down to a few choice words for the Christchurch City Councillors. Outspoken New Brighton Business and Landowners Association Chair has criticised some of the actions proposed in the Council's long-term plan. Marcus Gibbs reports. Paul Zarnan sharing a few home truths about the Christchurch City Council's long-term plan. There isn't a single project that's going to come out of the LTP that will uh, move New Brighton ahead. The New Brighton Business and Landowners Association chair not impressed with the plans committed to his stomping ground. Currently the budget allocation for New Brighton in the long-term plan is insufficient to enable the council's master plan. This is a document that's been worked on for three years now and the budget just simply isn't there to be able to do the public space actions. Paul Zarnan recently had an opportunity to sit in the mayor's chair while Leanne Dalzau was in China. Speaking from the point of view of a local resident, he criticised the council over what he called a series of broken promises. We're under danger today and being called a carper and a mona. Once again, New Brighton is coming to you with issues and complaints. But I've tried, I really have, to work with you. I'm tired. We've provided solutions to the issues to assist the public body in assisting us, the community. But you haven't listened, you're not helping, and this budget reflects that. Today, not much has changed. Paul Zarnan still wants the council to listen and take action to clean up New Brighton. It only takes a site visit to New Brighton to see the current state of New Brighton as well. Cracked and dirty footpaths, rubbish bins, toilets, all the uh, public body aesthetic and amenity values are very, very low. Zanin isn't the only one speaking out. On Friday, local residents had this to say about their beloved suburb. I mean, it's terrible at the moment, the way it's all just going downhill so quickly, it's just such a shame. And there's a lot of elderly people who can't travel, the bus service has been interrupted, and, you know, nobody cares. The area's downgraded a bit. We need a bit more life in, in here. 
So what can be done? 80% of the commercial district is owned by the private industry and Zanam wants the council to help the private sector enhance the streets and clean up the suburb. In 2018 and 2019 he would like to see the redevelopment of the pedestrian mall. We think that Christchurch City Council acknowledges New Brighton's place as a key activity centre and ensures that the budget allowance for the suburb reflects the visions of both the community, business and residential. Several thousand residents were red zoned in the east but 16 and a half thousand residents are still living there. The Mayor says the spotlight needs to be on New Brighton as the suburb deserves attention. I don't think there's anyone around the table that doesn't agree that this is an area, an important area of our city that needs a special focus. The councillors and the Business and Landowners Association both agree that instead of focusing on individual projects, the future of New Brighton as a whole needs to be considered. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Well, still to come, sport and your region's weather. Chris Lynch, join me every Monday at 8.30 on CDV as we discuss the issues affecting you, your family and everything to do with Canterbury. That's CDV 8.30 right here. Computer not working? Replace or repair? DIY or get a technician? Looking for parts? Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. The preparation. The devotion. The fearlessness. The intensity. Runway model management. First impressions are everything. Sinclair and the team at Gone Fishing as they bring you great stories, fishing tips and beautiful scenery. Gone Fishing, Friday night at 8.30, right here on CTV. And welcome back to CTV News Now. Here's Gordon and Finlater with a roundup of the weekend sport. It was a night to remember on Friday as AMI Stadium bid farewell to five long-term Crusaders in the form of Dan Carter, Richie McCaw, Willie Hines, Colin Slade and Tom Taylor. It couldn't have been a better farewell party with the side recording a blowout 58-17 win over the Reds to keep their playoff hopes very much alive. Colin Slade put his foot forward to fill the All Blacks 10 jersey with an impressive running game, while Dan Carter showed he's still up to the mark, making a number of line breaks when slotting in at first receiver, most notably setting up an impressive try, finished off by some great pace from Colin Slade. Fijian winger Nemani Nandolo was at his usual best, grabbing a couple of tries as he tormented the Reds' tacklers, while his fellow countryman Joni McAlai made his first appearance for the Crusaders off the bench, scoring with his first touch of the ball. The highlight of the night, though, was arguably Sam Whitelock's runaway try, as the big lock outran three quarters of the red side to dot down in the corner. The bonus point win puts the Crusaders just outside of the top six with a bye this weekend. The Canterbury Rams had a mixed weekend of results on the road to go to a record of five wins and five defeats. 
On Friday night, the Rams look to be heading towards another defeat to rivals the Wellington Saints, trailing by 10 going into the final quarter. The Rams saved their best till last, though, putting up a massive 35 points in the final quarter to take the win 89-85. to The side couldn't back up on Saturday in Invercargill, though, as they fell to their second loss to the Southland Sharks in the space of a week, going down 97-84. to Hayden Padden pulled off the unthinkable yesterday by not just winning the Otago Classic Rally, but by taking out the event overall as he beat off top Group N and Group A drivers in a 40-year-old BDA Ford Escort. Padden was always the favourite to take out the Classic event, but few would have predicted Padden to outpace some of the country's top drivers in late four-wheel drive cars. Padden's effort makes him the first driver to win a round of the New Zealand Rally Championship in a two-wheel drive vehicle since Neil Allport all the way back in 1987, a feat that may never be repeated. The next round of the National Championship is in Canterbury at the end of the month. And finally tonight, the mainland tactics take on the Central Pulse in Potorua this evening. It's sure to be a special occasion for one long-stay tactic, bringing up a special milestone when she steps onto the court. Tactics captain Anna Thompson will bring up her 100th game for the franchise when her side take on the Central Pulse tonight. It's quite strange looking back and, and realising that you've, you've played 100 games or will play 100 games and um, yeah it's, it's a great privilege and, and I feel really lucky that I've been able to do it here in the red and black country um, but you know in the end of it it'll just be um, another game we're going to get out there and, and put our best out on show. Thompson has been with the franchise since its inaugural ANZ Netball Championship season back in 2008. With one club play as a rarity in this day and age, it's a surprise to see a player bring up 100 games all for the same team. I think that's the nature of netball these days. I think um, you know every team each year is trying to put together the best team that they possibly can, and there's always names thrown around, and there's always um, you know different opportunities that have um, that come into it. And yeah, there's been different op opportunities at different times throughout the, um, the last eight years where maybe there's been a, a chance to go somewhere else. But um, I knew that my heart was here, and I knew that I wanted to be here, and you know it was the best thing for my netball at the time. So no regrets at all and um, yeah just loving every minute of it. Coach Sue Hawkins knows how rare a character like Thompson is and she's looking to repay the long-time Cantab with some solid recruitment over the off-season while she'll also be looking to keep the core of her squad together as they build for a brighter future. Loyalty is you know, just doesn't happen anymore. Um, players go where coaches are Thank you, Anna. <laughs> she didn't move because I was here. No, but players are, um, no longer have that connection. They go where the dollars are. Um, they go where the other players are. And um, I think it's, it shows real character of Anna to stay in this position. And it's been a hard position. You know, tactics have had it hard for the last six years. And, uh, you know, we're on the brink of changing it and, you know, it might have we might have lost it this year but you know this next year so now I know what we've got who's out there um, what we need to bring to the the table um, things will start moving again for now though the side will be looking to get their first win when they take on the central pulse the teams met back in round three of the competition with the pulse coming out winners 48 points to 41. While a win tonight would be nice, at 28 the captain knows there's plenty more netball to be played. It's year by year and as long as I'm still enjoying it and as long as I'm still good enough then I'll keep putting my hand up and again you've just got to reassess every year and, and realise um, and figure out what's best for you and, and your life and um, you know I've been lucky enough to represent the Silver Ferns and do things like that, like that. so um, yeah at this stage it's one year at a time and um, whatever happens will happen. Tonight's match gets underway at 7.40. You're up to date with the latest in local sport. I'm Gordon Findlater for CTV Sport.
Thanks, Gordon. Time now for your region's weather. Good evening, Canterbury. Let's start with today's temperatures. Okay. Down in Timaru, you had a high of 18 today. Tamuka and Geraldine, you were also both on 18 degrees. Slightly warmer in Methven with a high of 19. Ashburton and Rakaia, 18 degrees for you. Darfield, you had a high of 19. Leeston and Rolleston shared 20 degrees. Lincoln and Christchurch had a high of 20 degrees. Over in Akaroa, 20 degrees for your Monday. So what are you doing on Friday? To the Waimakariri district now, Rangioro, Kaipoi and Amberley, 20 degrees for you. Do you get a break? Taking a look further inland, Caldwarden, Hamner Springs and Cheviot all had a high of 19. Kaikoura had the region's high today of 21 degrees. Now to tomorrow's temperatures. Timaru, rain developing during the morning, then easing to showers during the afternoon. Cold with gusty southwesterlies. Tonight's low 9, tomorrow's high 13 degrees. For whatever we Ashburton, a chilly wet Tuesday in store for mid Canterbury with rain developing and cold southwesterlies becoming gusty. Tonight's low 9, tomorrow's high 13. When you hurt me and if you loved me, for whatever reason. To the garden city now. Fine at first, but make sure you wrap up warm as rain developing by lunchtime with blustery cold southwest winds. Tonight's low getting down to 9, tomorrow's high 15. Kaikoura, a dry morning for you, but a wet afternoon and windy as well. Tonight's low 9, tomorrow's high 15 degrees. It's always nice to see you. In other areas around the region now, expect a showery day. Tamuka and Geraldine, rain with a high of 14. Methven and Rakaia, you can also expect 14 degrees. Darfield, 14 for you. Leeston and Rolleston, slightly warmer with 15 degrees for your Tuesday. Over in Akaroa, 15 for you. Rangioro, Kaipoi and Amberley, cloudy and becoming rainy, a high of 16. For whatever reason, I can't Up north in Colwyn, Hamner Springs and Cheviot, also cloudy, becoming rainy with a high of 16 degrees. Looking ahead for Canterbury now, mostly fine on Wednesday with sunny periods and high cloud, moderate northerly winds. Fine and mild on Thursday with high cloud and fresh north to northwesterly winds decreasing. Cooler southwesterlies developing at night with some rain. Cloudy on Friday with a period of rain and fresh cold southwesterly winds. Snow will fall down to 600 metres. Showers clearing but remaining cloudy and cold on Saturday with gusty southwesterlies easing. Mostly fine on Sunday with sunny periods and light northeasterlies. And that's your weather update for Monday. Thanks, Mercy, and that's CTV News for Monday. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jared McCulloch. Good evening. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.